So it is uh, Sunday, the 12th of November, 2017. I was in the middle of a little monologue about how Montreal Unitarians have misused and abused the uh, criminal justice system to uh, try and shut down my peaceful public protest against Unitarian Universalist clergy abuse and other Unitarian Universalist injustices and abuses in front of the Unitarian Church of Montreal. And I was talking about how Reverend Diane Rollert and various other Montreal Unitarians had uh, obtained a restraining order against me on the basis of claiming to be in fear for their personal safety and so on back in 2007, 2008. Um, and it looks like the uh, tape ran out, as it were. So missed some of the what I was saying. So I'll just backtrack a little bit. Uh, so what I was saying was that uh, when the restraining order expired after one year, which they were able to obtain on the basis of what I consider to be, you know, paranoid fantasies or perjurious lies or a combination of both, uh, I resumed my protest. And w the, the very first Sunday where I resumed my protest, the Reverend Diane Rollert, essentially alone, with no one with her to you know, serve as protection, no you know, hefty Unitarian person as a bodyguard, walked out of the church. She walked right up to these steps here. I think she was actually standing on the lower step, and I was standing about here. So really not very, very far away, you know, about four or five feet away from Reverend Diane Rollert. And she said, you have no right to be here. So she was essentially claiming, you know, that even though the restraining order had ended and I had honored it, by, I shouldn't say honored it because it wasn't very honorable, but I, but I didn't violate it, put it that way. You know, I, I, I lived up to the terms of the order, which was to keep the peace for a year and to not be anywhere near the Unitarian Church of Montreal for a year. I did do that, um, which prevented me from protesting in front of the church for one full year, basically suppressed my right to engage in peaceful public protest in front of church for one year. Um, so this was, in my view, a, a, a misuse and abuse of the criminal justice system that uh, actually did successfully suppress my charter guaranteed civil rights and freedoms for one full year, at least in terms of being able to engage in peaceful public protest outside the Unitarian Church of Montreal. And so getting back to Reverend Diane Rollert, you know, here she is after the restraining orders ended telling me that I had absolutely no right to be there in front of the church protesting again. And I responded by saying, well, I don't think that's quite how the system works. <laughs> I think uh, you can try and get another restraining order, but I honored this one and then now I'm back, you know? So if you want another restraining order, you're gonna have to go through the process of getting another restraining order. Um, and that you, it certainly wasn't a permanent uh, restraining order. It didn't say I could never again be anywhere near the Unitarian Church of Montreal. It, it said I could not be in front of the Unitarian Church of Montreal for a one-year period, and I respected that. Again, respect is maybe not the best word, because <laughs> I didn't actually respect it in the sense of genuinely respecting the cynical misuse of the criminal justice system, but I did adhere to the uh, adhere to the conditions. You know, I stayed away from the Unitarian Church of Montreal for one full year from the time of signing the peace order until it was over a year later. And then I resumed my protest as I had pretty well said I would do. <laughs> um, when, uh, when I was forced to sign the peace order, when I was walking out of court, I said thanks for the vacation. <laughs> In other words, you know, I'll be gone for a year, but I'm going to be back when, when the year's up. <laughs> and uh, and uh, <clears throat> that was that. Um, so I was back, and Reverend Diane Rollett was telling me I had no right to be there quite forcefully. And, and the main point that I was trying to make is that she showed not the slightest fear of me. You know, this whole restraining order had been based upon Reverend Diane Rollert and various other Montreal Unitarians, including Sue Montgomery, uh, claiming to be very, very frightened of me, fearing for their personal safety and so on. Um, 
and you know, so that's how they obtained the restraining order. Um, well, when it ended a year later, and I'm in front of the church protesting, Reverend Diane Rollard walked to within just a few feet of me, and without showing the slightest fear, you know, quite forcefully told me I had no right to be there. You know, she, as I said, she, she didn't have any other person with her as a kind of bodyguard to protect her if, if I was to, you know, physically attack her or something, um, which was, you know, basically she was in her depositions to the police, essentially claiming that she was afraid that I was going to physically attack her, as did various other Montreal Unitarians, even though I'd never physically attacked any Montreal Unitarian prior to that date. And in fact, that even not responded when I was uh, assaulted with, with uh, defensive force, because there were a few occasions prior to this where I'd been assaulted by Montreal Unitarians or people uh, associated with the Unitarian Church of Montreal who weren't necessarily Montreal Unitarians. And on a couple of those occasions, I actually uh, called in complaints to the police about the assaults. Um, so, so anyway, you know, I'd never shown any violence. So here's somebody having a good look at the uh, shock slogan. So, uh, you know, I'd never shown, you know, I'd never been uh, physically violent in any way, even when assaulted. <clears throat> and uh, so there really was no reasonable grounds to claim, you know, that uh, their personal safety was in... I'm talking to my camera, <laughs> narrating. Um, so, uh, so uh, <clears throat> the uh, the uh, upshot is, is this, is, you know, that, that uh, I'd never shown any signs of physical violence, uh, never shown any uh, proclivity towards physical violence, never made any kind of threats of physical violence against Montreal Unitarians, and yet uh, they were able to obtain this uh, restraining order on the basis of, uh, I think, uh, at, least, at least in some cases we're talking of uh, deep, deep personal insecurity and uh, even paranoid delusions, assuming what they're saying is true. <laughs> you know, assuming they really believe what they're saying and what they're afraid of, then I'd say, yeah, you're suffering from paranoid delusions. You know, maybe you should see a psychiatrist. Uh, but of course, they could have just been lying. Could have just been outright lying to uh, force an end to my protest. It certainly looks like uh, Reverend Diane Rollett was outright lying based on her behavior after the fact. Um, so how are we doing here? Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure it's still recording because uh, sometimes the camera does shut off uh, before it uh, should. So, so anyway, uh, you know, it wasn't just Reverend Diane Rollert who said I had no right to be there. The president of the church, who I think at the time was, uh, uh, I can't remember her name exactly, Marlo something or other, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, she was also insisting I had no right to be there and so on. And and so, in fact, you know, the police continued to intervene uh, in 2010. There were quite a few interventions, uh, some of which, you know, where the police were, were uh, essentially trying to dissuade me from protesting, you know, and, and saying, you know, that they would uh, arrest me and so on and so forth. Uh, in fact, in 2010, now that I think of it, uh, I believe it was June of 2010, uh, I had a meeting with the lieutenant of Station 11, you know, about the situation. What had happened is I'd been arrested for unpaid tickets because I refused to pay for a ticket for writing uh, chalk slogans because I believe it's well within my constitutionally guaranteed civil rights and freedoms to write chalk slogans like this. And uh, in fact, that's, I've only been ticketed once. Uh, you know, on other occasions there's been some dispute about whether or not I can write chalk slogans. And I told the cops, I said, well, you check your lawyers, I'll check, I'll check, you know, with my legal advice people and, uh, 
and you check with your lawyers and we'll, we'll see what the situation is. You know, feel free to give me a ticket because I'll contest it right up to the Supreme Court if it comes down to it. Because um, I would. You know, if I get one more ticket for writing chalk slogans, believe me, I'm going to be contesting that ticket right up to the Supreme Court if it comes down to it. Um, and so in the end, they recognize my right to, you know, have chalk slogans. So, so essentially, that means that the one ticket that I did get for writing chalk slogans uh, never should have been admitted. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why I refused to pay it. So anyway, so I was arrested for unpaid tickets by two rookie cops, young guys. Um, looked like they were in their early 20s kind of thing. And they took me for a little ride in their police car. Because in addition to arrest, well, yeah, they arrested me. So they could have just, you know, had me sign something about, you know, going to court, blah, blah, blah. But they didn't. They, they took me for a little ride. And during the little ride they took me for, they were threatening to throw me in jail and have me arrested on criminal charges again and blah, blah, blah. And they were quite uh, aggressive and nasty about it. So I complained about this to Station 11. I said, hey, you know, these guys are out of line. Whoops. <laughs> um, you know, they were basically making uh, threats and, and uh, that they were quite unnecessary and not justified. Um, and so as a result of that, I ended up in a meeting with the lieutenant of Station 11 and uh, a detective, a sergeant detective actually. Um, and uh, you know, the purpose of the meeting was to discuss this, you know, harassment. That was my understanding of the purpose of the meeting. Um, and so the lieutenant asked me what happened, and I told him what happened, and I told him how these rookie cops had threatened me with arrest and threatened me with imprisonment. And right when I did that, the detective who was seated to my right turned towards me and said in a loud, aggressive voice, I'm going to arrest you, and this time there's going to be a psychological assessment <laughs> or a psychiatric evaluation. I can't remember his exact words, but that's, that's what, it, you know, I'm going to arrest you, and there's going to be a psychiatric evaluation this time. Um, <clears throat> so when he did that, my first response was, oh, so you're suggesting I'm mentally ill? And he came back with, you are mentally ill. <laughs> so I responded with, well, if I'm mentally ill, uh, what mental illness am I suffering from? <laughs> and he came back with, oh, well, you know, I'm not qualified to diagnose you, blah, blah, blah. And my response was, well, if you're not qualified to diagnose me, you're not qualified to tell me I'm mentally ill. <laughs> and uh, the upshot of the whole thing was, is that I brought a police ethics commission complaint against the detective um, for his intimidation and harassment, because uh, that's exactly what that was. He was, he was you know, I, I was complaining to Station 11 police about these young rookies threatening me with arrest and imprisonment when they really had no grounds to do so. It was basically just police intimidation and harassment. And so what happens is detective engages in even worse intimidation and harassment in this meeting with him and the lieutenant. Um, so, so I brought him in front of the Police Ethics Commission and it was settled to my satisfaction in conciliation. I didn't have to accept the uh, conciliation. Um, in fact, the organization who I was essentially who that was helping me, uh, Mouvement Action Justice, had a policy of never accepting conciliation, always taking it to the next level. Uh, but I wanted to show that I'm a reasonable person and I also wanted to show that, you know, Mouvement Action Justice or, you know, can also be quite reasonable. Um, and so I decided that, you know, it had been made clear to the detective in question that uh, his uh, behavior was indeed harassment and intimidation and so on, and that this was clearly recognized. Um, and I accepted that. I, I didn't take it any further than that. Um, and uh, that's that, uh, as far as that goes. Um, so, 
Police interventions continued, but at a somewhat lower level. Um, in 2012 and 2013, there were fewer interventions, but of the interventions that happened, you know, at least three of them were, were basically the cops abusing their power. Uh, cops arrived at the Unitarian Church of Montreal. They got out of their cars. They introduced themselves to me. And then the next thing they said is, you have to go. <laughs> you have to leave. You, you can't be here kind of thing, you know. On three occasions, you know, basically telling me I have to leave. You know, here I am engaging in a constitutionally guaranteed civil right of engaging in peaceful public protest and these cops are telling me oh no, you can't protest here you got to go and so you know my response would be why you know why why do i have to leave because as far as i'm concerned i'm uh, just uh, engaging in my constitutionally guaranteed civil right and freedom uh, to engage in peaceful public protest you know those freedoms that soldiers fought and died for ostensibly remember those um, I didn't say that to them, but, but, you know, this is Remembrance Day weekend, so I want to underline that point. I want to underline that, you know, we remember soldiers on Remembrance Day, in least in part because they died preserving our civil rights and freedoms. Um, and here are these SPVM cops doing their best to dissuade me from exercising my civil rights and freedoms. even bringing false criminal charges against me on occasion. Um, so anyway, getting back to these cops, uh, one of them actually said, you know, premium asset and zone dot the bus. In other words, firstly, you're in a bus stop zone. <laughs> in other words, he's essentially saying, you know, it's illegal to protest in a bus stop zone, you know, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Um, and, uh, and meanwhile, he was actually part